So hi, um, I'm glad everybody could make it today. Um, this is Marianne Leon. Marianne and I did an interview earlier this month. Um, and from that interview, I'm working on a piece for a group promoting Italian American works out of America for Italians in Italy. Um, also introducing one of her books, Mahalo Speaks Up, she's gonna read a little bit from it today, to a Sarasota Library Board um, group next week as part of the Friends of the Selby Book Project. Um, and she's also um, a journalist um, and has written numerous articles um, over the years. So, you know, it's such an honor to have you with us this afternoon. Thank you for coming. Oh, thanks, Courtney. You're making it easy. Really, it'll, it's, it'll be fun. I look forward to reading from my book about my mother and uh, anything else. You know, I have a piece um, that I propose reading that was printed in Corriere de la Sera and also printed here uh, in English um, about learning Italian, which I had to learn because my first book, Jesse, was published by Nutrimenti and uh, came out three years ago in Italy. And I got to go on a book tour and also to present at the Festival Letteratura in uh, Mantova. So that was a huge thing, so. Well, that's wonderful. Um, I'm going to hide myself. And if any of the panelists have questions at the bottom of the screen, you can see the Q&A. At any time um, while the webinar is happening, type your question in. And at the end, um, we can you know, get to the questions and Marianne will answer them. So thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, I want to read um, first from uh, the the piece that opens the book about my mother. My mother came here at either 16 or 18, I'm not sure which, uh, to escape fascism and an arranged marriage. And there was a big secret she kept from me for years and years. And all immigrants have secrets, I think. I think it was because I, you know, I didn't really ask her enough questions about what it was like. And I think they feel, I think my mother felt like I don't know what to say. I mean, I, I don't know how I can explain it to you, little American child. So anyway, I would like to start by reading um, from that piece. It's, it's called The Official Story because every immigrant has an official story and then there's a real story. So this is the official story. My mother was from Abruzzo. She was from Sulmona, which is the uh, city that is um, uh, famous for confetti, the uh, candy colored covered almonds that people throw at weddings. And uh, it's also Ovid's birthplace, but she lived five miles outside um, on a garlic farm. And Abruzzo is famous for uh, Aglio Rosso, the um, red garlic. And that's where she grew up on this garlic farm. So the official story, the young girl crouches listening to the men decide her fate. She is still as a woodland creature, hidden among the goats in the barn that is attached to her whitewashed stone house on the outskirts of Sulmona, at the, font, at the foot of the fearsome Apennines. The oil lamp in the primitive kitchen gives a falsely cheery glow, one that belies the grimness of the talk within. Excuse me, one of my rescue dogs is just, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, the oil lamp in the primitive kitchen gives a falsely cheery glow, one that belies the grimness of the talk within. Her father offers two pigs and five hectares of land. The hunchback laughs and shakes his head. He knows that he is the solitary bidder for this skinny girl. Il Duce has promised a bounty on sons. This rag looks unlikely to be the mother of future soldiers. Even in the gloom, the girl can see the hunchback's blackened teeth, his twisted back. He is old, older than her father. His sour smell rises above the pungent odor of the goats who mutter and shift beside her. Their devil eyes like his, the gobo, the hunchback who will take her to his bed. She hates her father. He is cruel, his green eyes glinting with spite. Her mother sleeps in the girl's narrow bed with her at night. Sometimes her father comes home drunk, his short, thick body knocking into things, and then he grows into a towering colossus, a monster inflated by the rough talk at the cafe in the piazza. 
He strikes her mother, calls her putana, tries to pull her from the girl's bed. He is a man who deserves respect, the head of the house. Her father is a fascist. He lives by Mussolini's words, believe, obey, fight. But his wife fights him. She spits in his face. The young girl knows what to do. She runs to find her mother's father, her nonno, who will come with a gun, the gun that kills the wolves that come down from the mountains at night to cull the herd of sheep. Her father is a wolf. He has no pity. He devours his prey. She and her mother are prey. And now the girl will be separated from her mother and go to live with the gobo in his filthy lair like a princess sacrificed to a dark god. But the very next day, her mother appears glowing like the Bafana at Epiphany and gives the girl a precious gift, her freedom. The mother tells the girl she will send her to L'America where she will marry when and if she pleases for love. She will not be a token for pigs or hectares of land. The girl herself will choose. She will live with the mother's sister in the absurd sounding state of Massachusetts where she will have a future and be safe in a place where the coming of war does not thud with the dull certainty of a hoe cracking the starved earth. She will know kindness. She'll be granted mercy. She'll be happy. On the boat crossing, she worries her meager treasures like rosary beads, the stark photograph of her unhappy mother, the picture frame made of sugared almonds, the dried flower, a secret token from the boy she wanted but could not have. She is dressed in many layers of clothes to save space in her bundle and to give the illusion of robust good health to the officials who guard the gates to La America. She allows herself to dream, to hope for happiness. The girl suffers a purgatory of years in the new world. The aunt puts her to work in the garment district of Boston mere days after her arrival. She sews all day long with people who can't pronounce her name and who speak amongst themselves in a harsh clacking tongue. She receives a new name, an American one that slightly resembles her own and makes her feel like a changeling. She gets lost in the maze of Boston and stands crying in the dirty streets. Her aunt's adopted son resents her, the interloper. She is sent to live with strangers. Six months after she arrives in this cacophonous, unfriendly place, she receives word that her mother is dead. Her father, remarries less than a year later, a disgrace. Now, even her yearnings for the lonely farmhouse are tempered with the understanding that return is impossible. There's no home, just a space on a strange family sofa where she hears them whispering about her at night. Then, a glimmer of light. Her aunt opens a store in an Italian neighborhood outside of Boston. The girl, works at the small cramped store, selling notions and yarn and makes a friend, a teenage girl who speaks her language. The joy of giggling in her mother tongue with someone her own age. For the first time since coming to La America, she doesn't cry at night. She is invited to the teenager's house, a wonderland of laughter and savory food. She is enfolded, entranced by this new family, so unlike her own. The mother is short and round and pretty. She makes jokes and her children adore her. The father is shy and gruff in the way of country people, but welcoming. There is a handsome older brother whose generous nature is glazed over with sorrow. The girl sees only his smile, his thick wavy hair, the elegant clothes. Within two weeks, there is a pact. They marry because the young man needs to settle down and the girl is young and innocent and from the old country. Love comes later, overcoming gratitude and the girl is at last happy. This was my mother. This was my father. This is the official story. And like all immigrant stories, it's not the whole story and it's only partly true. And you'll have to read the book to find out what real, the real story is, but. I, um, I want to read this from the uh, later part of the book. My mother uh, worked, my father had a bar in a neighborhood where everybody was from the same small village in Italy, San Donato Val di Comino. My dad had this bar and uh, my mother cooked for the bar. 
and my father died very young at 50. My mother was 43 with three kids. English is a second language and really no skills outside of cooking. But she made her way. She became, first she was a cook. Uh, she worked at my, at my school as a lunch lady, but she soon left there to work at um, a neighborhood restaurant where the wise guys all hung out. She then became a bookie and booked numbers in addition to cooking. So she was um, adept at surviving in this world. Later on, um, when I married, I married Chris Cooper, who was an actor, and uh, his family were all wasps. And uh, our two families did not meet each other because we eloped. We basically didn't want any hoopla for our wedding. So I wrote, this is part of a chapter I wrote about the first meeting uh, between my mother and Chris's family, which happened when he was out of town, which I still haven't forgiven him for. It's called Ma Gets the Last Word. Don't say fuck to the Coopers. I gripped Ma by both elbows and looked into her eyes. I was nervous. She shrugged me away, irritated, and headed back to her kitchen domain to produce one of her classic dinners. My newly acquired upright citizen in-laws were in town from Kansas City and about to meet my family for the first time, even though my husband and I had been married for two years. I was on a random visit home when my mother-in-law phoned to say that she and my father-in-law were at Mass Eye and Ear to deal with his detached retina. My husband, Chris, was in London performing in a Tennessee Williams play directed by Harold Pinter, but that oddball juxtaposition was not as bizarre as the one about to happen in my childhood home. The Leones and the Coopers had never met because Chris and I had eloped, if that's what you call it when you live together for five years and decide to avoid future bureaucratic hassles by legalizing the situation in as low key a way as humanly possible. That meant um, telling both sides of your family that you had summer stock in a few weeks and no time for an elaborate wedding. Now my husband was getting to act with Lauren Bacall in London and I was left to wrangle the relatives meeting for the first time ever across a chasm as wide and mysterious as the Sargasso Sea. When I wasn't considering and discarding various revenge scenarios for Chris in my head, I was stamping down my teenage id, fear and shame demons that had arisen from the place kept at bay by my newfound happiness with Chris. I had met my in-laws before this impromptu visit to our house and we had spent our first Christmas as husband and wife with them. When we drove up to their home, I suddenly channeled my mother. I turned to him and said, what the fuck, Chris? Guts, you didn't tell me you lived in a national monument. I was intimidated by the looming three-story Southern colonial mansion sitting in front of a fountain on a grand boulevard whose white crenulated pillars stood like a phalanx of bodyguards already deeming me unworthy to cross the threshold. Once inside, I found myself reverting to my trisyllabic word posture, the shield from my uncertain teen years. Let's go into the library, Chris's mother said, her Texas accent turning library into library. How magnanimous, I stuttered, noting with fleeting terror the spaghetti sauce bubbling on the stove as we passed quickly through the tiny kitchen. We wound our way through the stately dining room, past the grand staircase, through a Versailles-like living room, and into the library. Take pictures, my family suggested when I described the house to them later that night. I wondered how Chris's mother would react to my documenting her house like an insurance adjuster after a flood. I was right to be terrified of the tomato sauce, as it turned out. My jaw dropped as I watched Chris's mother boil the pasta in the sauce. And it kept coming back like a vampire's dregs for three consecutive nights. My mother-in-law added some ketchup to the thankfully near depleted sauce on the last night it appeared on the menu. I honed my acting skills to new heights and later lay in bed with Chris stomach growling. On Christmas Eve, when my family was having La Vigilia, a seven course feast featuring pasta alla vongola, stuffed calamari, shrimp and cod, my family called. What are they having? My Aunt Ellie asked, grabbing the phone from my mother. I was too depressed to answer. Mom, Marianne wants your recipe for the jello mold, Chris said after I hung up. He quirked his eyebrows at me and smiled his most devilish grin. Merkel whip, she answered. I stared at the green alien glob quivering before me and prayed for release. 
By the time my in-laws arrived at Ma's house, I was twitching and clearing my throat with a tick-like regularity not seen since my days as a first grader terrified by the yawning gates of hell. Social awkwardness, pungent as my mother's tomato sauce permeated the air around the dinner table. My Aunt Sarah and Uncle Joe sat side by side, mute, corpse-like smiles plastered on their faces. Upon my in-law's arrival, my mother had groveled, salaaming before my mother-in-law's tall, blonde, all-American good looks. You so beautiful, she crooned like a plain song chant of appeasement. The other Mrs. Cooper, Mary Ann, yes, we have the same name, beamed with noblesse oblige. I thought of the stately portrait of Mary Ann in a celestial blue gown gracing her formal dining room as if to distract from the food served there. My own family's arts and crafts dining room looked kitschy and cramped, but the food was spectacular. I watched my handsome father-in-law eating his lasagna with relish. We got through the dinner, I thought with relief as the meal wound to a close. But while I made coffee in the kitchen, I heard my mother's voice from the other room, loud and defiant. I got back in time for the raised finger jab, punctuating the bark, no. She looked fierce, like she was channeling Anna Magnani via Benito Mussolini. When I want to die, I die. Now, Linda, you can't just, came the aggrieved voice of my father-in-law, cut short by another more decisive, no, from Ma. At the end of the day, Ma won the argument on euthanasia by sheer force of will. When I want to die, I die, was her coup de grace, delivered with the force of a karate punch to the throat. But she never once said fuck to the Coopers. Chris's mother deemed Ma a spit bar, and my mother's only remark about her, Sato Vace, when she was out of their shot was, yeah, she looking nice, but don't cross her, right? An astute observation as it turned out. Ready, do I have time for one more? I guess I do. Yep, you have time. Take okay. as much time as you'd like. Okay, well, this is, this is from an article about my learning Italian. Um, that was published originally in the Corriere della Sera when I was doing my book tour in Italy. This was a fantastic thing, getting to um, go to Florence and Turin and Rome and Abruzzo and read in my mother's hometown with my cousins there and everybody else. But the, the first one was at the Festival Letteratura. Letteratura. And I, I really wanted to re read this paragraph in Italian. So I spent a year learning Italian because all I knew were swear words in dialect. So this is called dreaming in Italian. I was waiting for my fanfare, which happened as a reward at the end of every Italian lesson I completed on the app I downloaded from Duolingo. I marveled at how psychologically astute the creators of this program were to laud me with trumpets for my fumbling attempts to be literate in a language I've demeaned my entire life. The musical flourish can't quite hide the snorts of derision coming from my Italian mother's ghost. Ma's ghost sat across from me at my scarred oak table and whispered swear words in dialect in a mischievous attempt to drown out the high-toned Italian trilled by the language app lady, the one I've named Livia after the domineering mother of Roman emperor Tiberius. There are two speeds for listening to Livia deliver a sentence she wants me to translate. Normal, which is really gibberish speed, and turtle for slow. Whenever my brain froze during a lesson and Livia sounded like she was making words up just to mess with me, I conceded defe defeat and clicked on turtle. Then Livia would repeat the sentence with enough disdain to corrode the microphone on my computer. I was learning Italian in haste because my first book, Jesse, had been published in Italy and I was invited to present at a prestigious international book festival in Mantova, followed by a tour that would include my mother's hometown in Solmona, the birthplace of the poet Ovid and famous for confetti, the sugared almonds given as favors at weddings. I wanted to read from the chapter where I described the famous Solmona procession called La Madonna che scappa the running Madonna, an Easter, Easter resurrection pageant that is really about the reunion of a grieving mother with the son she thought she'd lost forever. Every year during the Easter season, the Madonna Adolorata, draped in black, is carried on a bier by six men who employ a swaying dirge-like walk. Suddenly, the mother sees 
the risen Christ across the Piazza Garibaldi and the men run with her to meet her son. Her black robes fly away and white doves are released. Under her mourning clothes, the Madonna wears green to signify hope. My mother spoke of this procession with the wonder of a child. When I saw it a year after my own son had died, I was too stunned by grief to feel wonder. In my book, I described the power of its iconography, but I wrote it from the point of view of an outsider to this culture that could so accurately personify grief. For the Festa della Letteratura, I wanted to read my book in Italian and answer literate questions in my mother's language. It was the reason that I was haunted by my mother's ghostly snickering every day as I puzzled over the daunting passato remoto, the remote past tense for things that happened long ago. This was payback for things that happened long ago. During my stormy adolescence, I honed my tongue on my mother's fumbles with the English language until it became sharper than a serpent's tooth. I was humiliated by her accent, ashamed of how tongue-tied and cringing she became with my teachers, salespeople, anyone official. I was ashamed of the fact that she wasn't American. Ma's Italian sounded low and guttural and her dialect clipped off words, clacking over them like a knife chopping garlic. Her speech was an assault, harsh and ugly as we battled hopelessly, roles reversed, my mother muttering unintelligible remarks under her breath like a sullen teenager, I speaking trisyllabic words I knew she couldn't understand, and fake upper class fluty tones, the way I thought real Americans spoke. All the television sitcom moms I dreamed were mine warbled sweetly in a register an octave higher than my mother's throaty voice. When my mother spoke my name, she turned Marianne into Marianne, tainting it with her foreign pronunciation, stealing my wobbly, uncertain place in my own culture. I practiced sounding like the chirpy daughters of the sitcom moms, always aware of the role I was playing and of how much I was falling short of convincing anyone that I really belonged. I called my mother mom instead of mama in my desperation to sound like the sunny children of what I thought of as the real America. I begged my mother for lunch money so I could buy the plate of fried bologna and rock hard mashed potatoes offered at lunch rather than carry a greasy peppers and egg sandwich to school and look like a foreigner. I hid my mother from my teachers as if she were Mrs. Rochester locked in an attic. And now I was attempting to read my first book aloud in the language that was the source of such shame to my younger self. My mother's tongue sounded so much truer in the reading voice inside my head, the words so much more dense and layered and palpable than the language in which I wrote the book that I could not say them aloud without weeping. Some wellspring had been triggered. In English, I could read from my book about my son's death. In Italian, I could not. My mother was no stranger to grief. Widowed at the age of 43, she had three children, few marketable skills, and a tenuous grasp of the English language. My mother put on black clothes and prepared to immure herself in them for the rest of her life until her American friends intervened. But unlike me, she understood the necessity of taking time, singing songs of lamentation, even cursing the gods. A song of mourning from her region, Skuramai, translates roughly to you have left me dark. When my father died, I was 15 and humiliated by what, what I then thought of as my mother's excess of grief. I was American, I told myself. I wouldn't wail like some Mediterranean cliche, but my mother howled, bereft, and then went on raising us, making a living, eventually even finding joy while I developed asthma, my father's death settling on my chest like a stone, stealing my breath. As she aged, my mother goaded death, calling it to her to show she wasn't afraid. On one New Year's Day near the end of her life, I asked what her resolution for the coming year would be, and she answered, to be dead this year, then laughed, a dare for death to come for her. In one of my final daily lessons with Livia, before my trip to Mantova, the app wanted me to translate, oh gee, sono pronto morire. I could hear my mother's signature bark of mocking laughter Today, I am ready to die. Could have been the epitaph for the woman who pointed at hearses and said, look, there's my new car. My mother once told me she dreamed in Italian. Maybe that's why she's never spoken to me in my dreams, preferring the stillness of eternity to a revival of our one-sided linguistic bouts here on earth. 
I had withstood Livia's scorn for over a hundred days just before my presentation in Italian books tour. According to Duolingo, I was halfway fluent in the language of my mother's dreams. In Mantova, before an audience of 300 people, I was able at last to give my mother back her voice. From the distance of a half a century and with the shame I felt as a child dissipated and replaced by love, birthed in the empathy of my own loss, I was able to read aloud in Italian from the chapter describing the difficulties of mourning my son in an American culture that doesn't recognize the existence of age or death. Though choked with tears, I was able to read before the crowd. The last line of the paragraph said, torno di continuo in Italia perché è lì che l'ho trovato. I keep returning to Italy because it is there that I found him. But it wasn't only my son I was able to find this time in Italy. It was my mother, mama, not mom, that I invoked in my own voice that is as low as my mother's once was. Do we have time for another one? Courtney, I don't know. I'm, I'm, tell me. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you've been um, reading for about 27 minutes. So, I mean, you have like 10 minutes, 15 if you want. Okay, then I will read um, Nice, Like a Prostitute. Wonderful. <laughs> and that will be my last piece for now. A few years ago, I visited the Duomo in Milan where I saw many of the female saints extolled to me during my days at Our Lady Help of Christians Elementary School. There they were, an entire football field of mutilated women. There was St. Agatha, holding her breast before her on a plate, as if she were waitressing at a particularly gruesome horror movie version of Hooters. St. Agatha had them removed by pincers, in addition to being rolled over hot coals, all to preserve her virginity. Further along with St. Lucia, her eyeballs rolling around on another plate. She plucked out her eyes and handed them to a lascivious pagan suitor who admired them as the story went. It made me think of all the other maimed and butchered women who had fended off the advances of men and as a result met with a hideous fate, the female role models put forward by my teachers when I was an adolescent. I was a fast learner and I got the message, death before dishonor and sex meant dishonor. But that's not the message I got from my mother. Ma was at home with her body. Her sensuality was a mockery of the dire warnings my teachers gave me about hiding what was shameful and the source of sin, my prepubescent as yet unbudded body. There she is, my mother, memory imprinted, standing in a white rayon slip before a mirror, expertly slathering Revlon fire and ice on her lush lips for a night out with my father flaunting herself like a juicy peach waiting to be plucked, her cleavage brimming, no chance of those babies ending up sacrificed on a plate. At school, the nuns wanted us to become little Marys, ephemeral, pure, so not of this world that we could be assumed into heaven, body and soul, as all the pictures celebrating the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary showed. All of us were instructed to somehow make our flawed bodies like Marys, too pure for this earthly realm. Ma was of the earth, vulgar, grounded, nasty. She called me Miss Prim, a perfectly apt description of myself at age 12. Ma would never float up to heaven or anywhere else. As I got older, I managed to mind mesh the floaty otherworldliness of the Blessed Virgin, the martyr horror stories of the nuns, and my new found desire for boys into an obsession with romantic and tragic love complete with mournful child ballads that I droned in my room along with Joan Baez on my tinny record player. All of this was incomprehensible to my mother. Life was hard enough without asking for tragedy. To my mother, I was Miss Prim, no better than the nuns, pitiful women who chose God for a husband. But I secretly desired boys, not the stammering, pimply, self-conscious non-readers that were in my classes at school. I dreamed of dashing troubled Heathcliffs galloping down my working class street and whisking me away to some gloomy barren landscape where we could brood together and then make a turgid doomed love. Perversely, I also dreamt of laconic cowboys so exotic in their diffidence and calm demeanor, so different from my loud clamorous family. It didn't matter. I was invisible to boys. I was short, underweight, flat chested, spindly legged, disaster permed, wore braces, and my face was growing around my nose. 
Eventually, I lost the braces and the disaster perm and the rest of my body began to cooperate. Even though my learning curve was steep, I even began to decipher boys. When I married Chris, years after my mother had given up all hope of me ever finding someone blinkered enough to accept my unwomanly ways, my sloppy dress, my off-putting lippiness, she still couldn't believe it. I had never evolved into her image of a real woman, someone who worked her physical assets, and a man married me anyway, a handsome man who, more wondrous to behold, was a working actor already getting awards and recognitions. It wasn't about replicating Ma's relationship with my father. I perceived the electricity that crackled between them. I understood even before I knew consciously why we kids weren't allowed to tumble into their bed uninvited like the innocent American kids in the sitcoms I watched. Their parents were wearing pajamas. My husband and I had the same electricity. My mother couldn't see it. Worry about my failings as a woman clouded her judgment about us. Ma still remained perplexed, if not downright suspicious, about what Chris saw in me. She even asked him that one morning after I sat down with my own coffee without pouring him a cup first. How can you stand it? My husband just laughed, further tweaking Ma's suspicion. How could she know we were bonded by laughter and acting, and sex and food, that he twanged a familiar cowboy chord from my first Dewey dreams about love? Ma probably thought I had bewitched him somehow by a love spell with Fatura. The night we first met to run lines at my apartment, I cooked him a nervous dinner of pasta alla vongola. The Fatura was unnecessary for a man born in Kansas City and raised on frozen fish sticks and jello molds. The clam sauce became the spell. It was the Midwest that delivered him to me on a platter. I had her own gifts in that area. Ma was wary of Chris's skill as an actor. How could we tell when he was the real Chris? Early in his career, he did a heavy breathing movie of the week where he played a domestic abuser and secret homosexual drug, drug user. It became Ma's favorite movie. The one she sat the grandkids down to watch every time it was on. My six-year-old nephew required a parent-teacher conference at school after bringing a clipping from TV Guide for show and tell and announcing that his uncle beat up women and did drugs. Ma liked the operatic themes of lust and violence, but she was also known to mutter darkly, maybe there's a side to Chris, we don't know. I think she's letting herself go. This became Ma's number one worry after we had our son, the gnawing fear that I would let myself go. And according to every melodrama she had ever seen on television and in the movies, Chris would, as a result, leave me bedazzled by some beautiful actress who didn't dress in leggings and a tattered t-shirt. Ma was especially disgusted by the oversized billowy sundresses I wore in summer. On one visit to the seaside cottage she rented every year, my husband and I were able to go on a date while my mother babysat. I wore a black form-fitting dress and my mother was delighted. You look nice, like a prostitute, she said approvingly. The culture gap between us had never yawned wider. I wondered if she was talking tough, being ironic, or if she actually didn't understand the meaning of the word prostitute. Or maybe it was simply she was saying, stop hiding your body in oversized nun clothes. Was it only about the clothes? It was about so much more, about body image and approval and the ever popular, I'm not you theme that ran through our mother daughter relationship like a tired want want joke. It was undeniable that a sweep of my wardrobe then and now would reveal a closet full of clothes no different in color or style than a postulant entering the Sisters of St. Joseph Mother House in 1965 would pack in her suitcase. But even though I had appropriated the all black wardrobe of the Sisters of St. Joseph and however much, much I enjoy slopping around the house in my ankle length dresses that would be equally at home on a fundamentalist compound, I never ever bought into their sad anhedonic cult. I love sex and my aging scarred well-used body. I'm not Miss Prim or a little Mary. I'm my mother's daughter. And sometimes when I feel like it, I even dress nice like a prostitute. Thank you. That was awesome. I'm <laughs> laughing over here hysterically. <laughs> It's weird to read these things to like no reaction, you know, but. Oh, we're going to look back on this in years and be like, what were we thinking with Zoom and webinars? <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful. Thank you so much. We have questions. Um, cool. 
So, um, you know what, I'm going to go to the q and I don't know what anybody can see, so I'll read them. Okay, so um, Alan has a question. Was the segment nuts the first time you worked with your husband, Chris? Um, what was it like writing the screenplay and then playing the role? Oh, is he, what is he? Oh, nuts. Oh, okay. It was totally fun. I had not acted with Chris since uh, Nancy Savoca. Do you all know Nancy Savoca, the filmmaker? It, um, Nancy Savoca did True Love and Household Saints and um, If These Walls Could Talk. She's a wonderful filmmaker. She, her senior project at NYU, which I answered an ad in backstage, it was called Bad Timing. Chris and I played husband and wife that long ago. This is like before we were married. So when Celine Rattre, who is a pr British producer, contacted me and asked me if I would write a 10 minute scene for part of a compilation and we would shoot it ourselves. Um, Chris at first was like, no, no. And I was like, what else are we gonna do? We're trapped here, it's a pandemic. So I wrote, I wrote the uh, scene and we just had a ball doing it. He, Chris was wonderful. He was the director and I was the sound person. We had a few harsh stories of, of uh, one night, it was like one in the morning and I was checking the sound and I was like, has this sound been off all night? <laughs> but then we found out it wasn't. And the other thing was never write wild turkeys into your scene because we have turkeys that come every day. And I think I'm the bane of the neighborhood because I feed them in my crone-like outfit. And uh, somehow when you point a camera at a being with a pencil eraser sized brain, it runs away. So <laughs> it took us days to get that shot. But otherwise we had a blast. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Okay, um, Jeff has a question. As I teach creative writing, I wonder if you can say something about the process of recovering and recording these memories, how they went from concept to the page. Um, you know, what I find found really strange for me is that I didn't keep a journal about the things my mother said and did, but their conversations are so vivid to me because my mother was extremely funny. And I do remember a lot, of, my friends quote her to me. My friends still quote my mother to me. Like my friend Maureen, my mother was visiting me. Maureen's mother died. Uh, we're all sitting around the table. I mean, Maureen's mother was old. My mother was older. My mother is trying to make Maureen feel better. And she says, Maureen, your mother's lucky. I wish I was dead. <laughs> I think she said this to make Maureen feel better. And the fact is, Maureen said every time she talked, thought of it, she cracked up for about for months afterwards. So I have a trove of stories like this. And um, so the way to answer your question, the way I fool myself when I'm writing these things is I say, I'm not really writing a book. I'm just writing an essay. I'm writing a collection of essays. And that's how that's how I did it. I wrote, you know, short pieces and then connected them and that was the only way I could do it without feeling overwhelmed. That's great advice. <laughs> um, okay, so Jason, um, other than your mother and Duolingo, were there any other methods, resources, or tutors that helped you learn the language in only a year? You know, um, no, because I heard the language all my life. So I knew how to, uh, you know, people think I'm Southern when I'm there because I, I unconsciously go into the Southern sh instead of just plain s but i also i have to say the only good thing about going to catholic school for 13 years was that my grammar is good and i think if you have good grammar it makes it easier to learn a language quite frankly so that was the only good news i noticed my husband doesn't have as good grammar he went to public school so they <laughs> he had a harder time learning languages so but it sounded familiar to me and i had four years of latin the latin helped too so I can see that. Yeah. I wish I could speak it every day because I can see that it's already starting to fade. But when I go there, it comes back. So. Good. <laughs> okay, Mike, um, I loved your descriptions of your mama's superhero, being able to take <laughs> hot plates out of the oven without gloves, <laughs> being able to beat um, unformed dough into shape until she squeezed thin strips of linguine out of it. 
her hands like claws and in general, her body and person being able to withstand the harshness of life. How much of your mom do you see in yourself? More and more. I mean, as I, as I've gotten older, I, um, I, I totally take her strength as my own. And I, I, you know, I beat myself up all the time for what a horrible, I mean, I was such a trial as, as a kid for her. Um, and I think about what it must've been like to come here, you know, at that early age all by herself and never to see her mom again or any of that. Uh, I just, I think she was a really, really strong woman. And uh, I also, I think I have her same very dark humor, so. <laughs> um, but my mother actually, my mother gave me, uh, she told me that I was a wonderful cook and that I was a really good mother. I think my mother was a little bit in awe of me because my son was severely disabled and she saw that, you know, Chris and I did everything we could with Jesse. And um, I think, I think that impressed her, you know, but she was wonderful with him too. Yeah. I, I saw a picture of her and him yeah. together. Yeah. And you they, they, just tell. He yeah. was very amused by Ma. <laughs> <laughs> Gee. <laughs> um, so um, Vera would like to know where we can follow you and read all of your stuff. Well, okay. Um, <laughs> I, I will tell you my website. I, I just need to kidnap a millennial. They need <laughs> to come here and live with me. I will feed them. But I, my website is so pathetic. It's not, a, a lot of my writing's there, but not all of my writing. Um, I have two books. I have Jesse and um, Ma Speaks Up. I have a third one that I'm just about finishing about rescue dogs and grief and mutual healing. And uh, I also have a book of short stories that my agent is going to, is shopping now called Christina the Astonishing, which is about Catholic school in the, in the six, early 60s. Gee, oh, is it autobiographical, I wonder? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I've read quite a few of those. And actually, Chris and I are going to do some of those as podcasts, we've oh, decided. Fun. Yeah. And um, so, yes, I have my crummy website. I'm um, also, I'm on Twitter. Um, I think it's at Leonie Marianne someone else, a, a millennial set it up for me. <laughs> and um, and uh, I'm also on Facebook, um, which I know, you know, I, I only check in every once in a while. So I'm on, I have a open to the public Marianne Leone uh, site there too. So, but my website is Marianne Leone Cooper because there was another Marianne Leone and I wasn't smart enough to say Marianne Leone writer. <laughs> so I just put Marianne Leone Cooper, which means no one can find me probably. <laughs> well, when you do a, a Google search for, for you, um, a lot of your journalistic pieces come up. Oh, so good, that's good. Nice. That's good. 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 Um, let me see. There's some time. I don't know if you can see the chat, Marianne, but um, if not, I'll download it for it, you. Yes, I can put it up. Uh, oh, it's on the side. I can see it. There's just some commentary about Simona and um, your reading. Um, Joanna, have you ever written dramatic scenes of the Coopers and the Leone family? Such rich material. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, they only met that one time, unfortunately. Uh, I have written, you know, uh, I haven't really written more about it. I've written, um, I've written essays that are in different, uh, like there's one about how Chris Chris has fulfilled my um, first cowboy yearnings. And uh, I, I, that's in a book called Teen Idols. Because when I was a kid, I, I was in love with uh, Sugarfoot, Will Hutchins. And, uh, and it was really weird that like Chris kind of reminded me of him <laughs> when I first met him. Or he just, uh, it was a memory from far, you know, because he had that cowboy thing. I mean, the guy lived on a you know, ranch and, you know, castrated bulls and whatever <laughs> so but no i haven't i haven't done more drama about the coopers and the leones <laughs> a tv sitcom right right i think ma could be a tv sitcom actually oh i believe that yeah. <laughs> i mean y'all I mean, have to read this book i'm telling you if you're not taking it. just ma as a bookie it, it just kills me i mean i know courtney you wanted me to read about <laughs> about the story about when I went home one time after my mother had been widowed <laughs> for a while. And she said, I had dinner with a jewel. And I said, oh, you're, are you dating a jeweler? 
And my sister is sitting at the table. She says, Angelo, which is the crime family here in Boston. So she's telling me she had dinner with the Angelos. Okay. Um, she goes, yeah, nice guy. Okay. Well, That's you know, awesome. when you wrote about, um, you know, walking in and seeing her photograph on the wall. And I mean, that yeah. moment for me, woman. Was it was only- amazing. She was accepted. Oh, totally. totally. It was just, it was a, it was really a, a yeah. wonderful thing. I thought, <laughs> I mean, that, that spoke to me. Um, okay. So we have oh, a couple more questions. Um, thank you for talking about Italian, learning Italian. I look forward to reading the article. Um, what would you say any of the benefits for speaking, reading Italian, other than reading your work in your mother's native language from your perspective? Um, I love to share these kinds of anecdotes with my own students. Grazie. Well, uh, for me, I mean, it actually was, it was necessary because the publishers who drove us on this um, mini book tour that I did after Mantova did not really speak English. So I spoke Italian the whole time. Um, I'm sure it wasn't all great Italian, but I, I spoke Italian to them the entire time. So that was, you know, that worked out great. And uh, I don't know, I just, I really, I, I try and keep up on it. I, I read things in Italian. I'm part of a group now that uh, Eddie Junta, I don't know, do you know her, Courtney? She's written yeah. some wonderful, mm-hmm. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm part of this hundred word group. We write a hundred words every week and you just take off the last person. It's a wonderful um, honing device for your own writing. I tend to overwrite and this keeps you, uh, you know, on, on the straight and narrow. But some of the people in this group are Italian. So I'm reading in Italian too. So, um, so I keep it up as best I can. It's, it's difficult. I mean, if you're not speaking it every day, it's, it's hard to keep up, but I'm trying as hard as I can. Well, as somebody who is not fluent in Italian myself, um, mm-hmm. I force myself to do some translation to just yes. kind of, so that I know whenever I'm in Italy, I can at least, you know, find my yes. way around. And I get those short stories with the um, English on one side and the Italian on the other. Those are really good. As, you yeah. know, to learn idiomatic Italian. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Um, oh, so Peter Covino's in your group? Apparently. Yes, Peter Covino, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Joanna, um, I see, is here. Hi, Joanna. She's the one who um, got me this gig with so. you. So that's- Yes, so thank, you. thank you, Joanna, because yes. we have not met. <laughs> yes. Um, um, okay, so there's two more questions. If anybody has any other questions, now's the time to drop them in. Um, and um, I would love friends and family to have access to this wonderful meeting. Where can it be found? Um, so if you're a member of EASA, you have um, a link after, you know, the webinar is done, I'll put it together and link it up. And you can go in through the portal and have access to all of the webinars, in fact. What if you're not a member, though? I mean, I, I probably have friends who had to miss this because they were working or whatever. Is how do you how do you see it then? No. Well, I don't know. We'll have to talk um, okay. with the EC and find out about that. But I can I can let you know definitely. Okay. Awesome. Great. Cool. Thank you. Um, okay, Ellen. Since you discussed your earlier acting job working with Nancy Savoca, can you talk about the difference between working for men directors compared to women like Nancy? Well, Nancy's the only woman director I worked with. And, you know, she was a friend too. She was, one thing I really appreciated about Nancy that I tell all, you know, because Chris and I talk to young would-be directors all the time. And I tell them all that they should do what Nancy did and take an acting class so that you understand what you are asking your actors to do. It, unless you've done that. I mean, we, we spoke at NYU at one point to a directing class and, you know, I, I Unless you, unless you try to do it yourself, you're not gonna understand what you're asking your actors to do. So it's always good to take an acting class. Nancy was very, um, very keyed in. I mean, she's very, she's intuitive. And of course we were on the same page. Uh, she recently sent me both of her student films and, and True Love, which 
we were both breastfeeding our babies on set. I mean, that was a big difference. It's like when your director and you are both have your babies on set, <laughs> it was a big difference. And also, you know, I had told her stories about my family and she asked me if she could use some of the lines in the, um, in the script and we ended up doing it. Like when my Aunt Ellie went to New York, she said, you know, Uncle Benny and I went to see that last tangle in Paris. It was filthy. You saw the bush. And she wanted, she wanted me to use that line, and I did. Even though as a writer, you're jealously guarding those lines for yourself. <laughs> but she was fantastic. And But, you know, I've had male directors that were, you know, the way I look at it is casting is 90% of it. You know what I mean? So directors will mostly leave you alone if you're doing the right thing, you know? I do know that when I came back to The Sopranos, I hadn't acted in 10 years because I was home with my son. I mean, both of us couldn't be away. So when I went back, I, I still look at the way I entered for that first um, episode, the way I entered the kitchen. To me, I look like I'm shot from a gun. It's, I think it's because I was like so keyed up to do this. And I do remember Alan Coulter, the director saying, take it down about 90%. <laughs> which was kind of horrifying <laughs> well you know I was going to ask you to make a fluff or nutter sandwich <laughs> but, um, I figured that would be a little weird <laughs> my teeth ache just at the thought of it <laughs> so um I'm getting um a, a note you're just a disembodied head Courtney can you please um put your video on? <laughs> but uh, you know you're the you're the main yeah. <laughs> made spotlight um so uh yeah so anyway um yes i'm winking at vera in her commentary in the in the chat because you know i'm not allowed to say that um <laughs> but um and it naturally marianne we would get you um you know your copy <laughs> as soon as it's downloaded from the cloud so you know uh, excellent thank you we maybe i can kidnap a millennial and put it on my website <laughs> Oh my goodness, I'm gonna fix that website for you. And I'm not a millennial. It's so awful. It's so awful. <laughs> oh my goodness. So um, you know what? Th this was wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, and thank you. Reading. Thank you. And thank you for all the great questions, really. If anybody has any more, I'm happy to talk about either um film or um or writing. Uh I do both. <laughs> This is true. Wonderful. Um, so we have um, another webinar in February, Jessica Jackson and Giorgio Bartolania, um, February 19 at 5 p.m. Eastern. And so if you're a member of Viasa, or I mean, essentially, if you're not a member, you're on the database, I always send these things out to you so that you can take advantage of this. It's an hour once a month. Come on, everybody have fun with us. This is just, you know, a way to stay engaged during pandemic. Yes. So. And also I'm doing a, I don't know if you guys know about Talking Sopranos, that podcast. I'm going to be doing one coming up with Michael Imperioli and Steve Sharippa. So Did they give you the date for that yet? We had one, but Michael wasn't feeling well. So now it's postponed and oh. um, I'll let you know and you can okay, put it yeah. up there. Yeah. I'm, I'm backdated on it. So I want, or I listen to them every so often and I'm like, wait, wait, is it this week? No, no, I know. I know. They had Federico on not long ago. And I told you the story when we were uh, sitting here that my parents, my grandparents that are behind me, I don't know if you can see that. Up a little oh, bit. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Um, were ravaged when they fell off the mantelpiece and Federico Furio from the Sopranos is the one who re who fixed it, who fixed my grandmother's face. <laughs> That's amazing. I mean, his work yeah, is- He's a beautiful. master. He is a master. Indeed. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me, Courtney. Well, thanks again for coming. Um, I'll be in touch because we're working on that piece, but um, you know what? Enjoy the snow and- it's, warm. it's beautiful. <laughs> have a lovely <laughs> evening. Thank you all also for coming. Thank you.